let's, uh, let's read scripture together. Let's uh, focus our hearts on the Lord this morning. Um, our scripture comes from uh, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though its mountains tremble at its swelling. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Yeah. 
Well, good morning. Glad to have everybody here with us this morning. And uh, as I was just discussing briefly, I can tell that none of the rest of you all are very sweet either because you didn't melt on your way in. Good morning. Part two. All right, glad to have you all. If you're a guest with us this morning, we would just like to tell you one thing, and that is um, if you got a bulletin when you came in, there's a tear-off in that bulletin. And we would like to just have you fill that out and you can either drop it in the offering plate when it comes by, or you can hang on to it. And then after the service, you can walk out these back doors, and there are blue tablecloth tables. And you can hand that to somebody there, and they will give you a gift just to show you how happy we are that you are here with us this morning. Also, if you have not yet downloaded the app uh, for Bellevue, please go ahead and... Uh, Go ahead and do that as we will be taking time to be transitioning more and more of our things over to it. And you can uh, find out already events that are going on. You can see the calendar. You can take notes uh, during the sermon. You can email those notes to yourself uh, to keep them uh, of the sermon. So it's, it's already a great and useful resource. And so just be going ahead and getting yourself used to that, uh, if you will. And now with that, brighten up everybody's day around you and give them a hug. Let's continue to stand and sing together. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope. Place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began, ash was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Released from my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your
were displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested in my life Yes, we're free, free forever, amen. When death was arrested and my life began, when death was arrested and my life began, that's when death was arrested and my life began. There's a 
We are children of God. Isn't that great news? Yes. We have been adopted by the King. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And God has given us the choice to be able to do that now, the freedom to be able to do that now. Hallelujah.
from the mountains Go on and tell it to the masses That He is God. After I turn my mic back on. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, with songs welling up in our hearts as we have sung praise to you that you so richly deserve. And so we ask, Lord, that this spirit of worship that is welled up within all of us as we have gathered together would continue as we give back to you, Lord, of which you have so richly given to us. Lord, we just pray that your grace would extend to that which we give, to have it be used in such ways in which your name and your glory, your kingdom would be built, and that more and more people both here in Owensboro and wherever you allow us to serve you, Lord, would come to know you. And so we just pray your blessings upon this and Lord may indeed would you empty out heaven upon us so that we can see you and shine like you in this world until you come again and we ask these things in Jesus name amen Good morning. I hope you're ready to study God's Word today. If you would, take your Bibles out, or if you don't have a Bible, feel free to use one of the Bibles in the seat rack in front of you and turn to two passages of Scripture. One is Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. The second um, passage is Luke chapter 15. So Ephesians chapter 1 and Luke chapter 15. One other thing, and that is that we encourage you to go on your Bellevue app if you've downloaded that, and uh, go and uh, click on today's uh, sermon notes, and you can follow along in those sermon notes there, or you can still do that in the bulletin right now, though that won't always be the case. In the 
in, in, in a month or so. But uh, we want you to start getting in the habit of, of doing it there on the app. What's great about doing it on the app is then you can just at the bottom, you click email and it, it'll email it to your email and then you'll have a, a record and you can file that away. And so it's a, it's a great, great resource. So uh, do uh, access uh, your outline on the app. You know, most of you know that we have four children and uh, that three of those children came to us biologically and our youngest son was adopted. Most of you know that. Some of you, that's new information. And adoption has been one of the, the absolute biggest adventures of our life. Um, there's a special tradition in our home and, uh, and in the homes of many who have adopted, and that is uh, the tradition of the gotcha day. The gotcha day. Now, of course, every year, each of us um, in our home have a family recognition and celebration of our birthday. You probably do that too. But only one in the Falls family uh, also has a gotcha day, and uh, that's pretty cool. Now, what is that? What is a gotcha day? That's the day of the year when we celebrate the specific day when we got our adopted son. Uh, Micah's gotcha day is July 9th. July 9th. It was on that day uh, over 11 years ago that we got him in Guatemala. And it was on that day that he became a member of our family. We adopted Micah. Now, so every year, in fact, this is going to happen here in about a month, every year on November 12th, uh, we celebrate his birthday. Now, we weren't there when he was born, but we've been with him and celebrated his birthday every birthday since, um, but uh, we weren't there when he was born, but we celebrate his birthday, and he gets gifts and all kinds of special things, and, uh, we, but on July 9th every year, we celebrate his gotcha day, and we do some gifts and things like that on that day too. So he, he gets a little unfair advantage in the family, a little bit of extra attention. Now all of us, you and me included, we have birthdays, right? We all have a birthday when God brought us into the world. But for those who come to Christ, for those of you that have entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and entered into God's family, you've been adopted through Jesus into the family of God, you also have a gotcha day. There was some spiritual gotcha day in your life when you, uh, you came to that place where you went, you know what, I know that I need to receive Jesus as my Savior, and you received Christ as your Savior. You were adopted into the family of God, and that was your spiritual adoption day, you know, your spiritual gotcha day, your, your day of your spiritual birthday, if you will. And some of you don't remember the exact day or, or the exact time, but you, there was a time when you yielded your life to Christ and were brought into the family of God through the adoption of his salvation. So many of you have a spiritual gotcha day. Some of you do not, but you can. You can have a spiritual adoption day, a spiritual gotcha day. In fact, maybe even today will be that day for you. Maybe today will be the day that you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're brought into a spiritual relationship with God that lasts forever. Wouldn't that be great if today was your gotcha day? The day when he became your father. I'll never forget the, the day that uh, we all ran down the steps there in Guatemala in this uh, nice hotel that we were at. And, and we were running down the steps because we had peered out the window and the, on the busy street. And we had seen the, the, uh, the, the car pull up. Um, and uh, the, the uh, foster mother come out and have Micah in her arms. And we were running down the steps to meet him in the lobby. And I can remember when we got up to the room and, and uh, we gave, gave mom a chance to, to hold him first. But then when he got, came and, and uh, got into my arms and I got to be his father. We celebrated and have celebrated ever since his gotcha day. Well, God wants to celebrate your gotcha day too. He wants you to be in his family. 
And if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, perk up your ears because God is about to invite you in. Now, if you would, take those scriptures that I asked you to look up, and, and uh, I'll read silently as you read aloud. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 1. Ver- what did I say? Oh, yeah, that would be odd, wouldn't it? <laughs> Sometimes I talk faster than I think. So, no, let's do it another way. I'll read aloud, you read silently. All right? <laughs> I knew once there was a laugh, I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. All right, verse 5 of chapter 1 of the book of Ephesians, the Bible says, He, that is God, predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. Mm. And then let's look at Luke chapter 15. Verses 1 through 7, the Bible says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just as I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. You can follow along in your outline and see that When we talk about your spiritual adoption into the family of God, your adoption into God's family displays certain things. First of all, it displays that God thought of you before there was a you. Now, I love this truth. God thought of you before there was a you. The Bible says in verse 5 of Ephesians 1, He predestined us... For adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now this is a seriously powerful truth that speaks mightily to the fact of your divinely determined dignity and worth. It ranks right up there with the fact that you were created in God's image as is stated in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, verses, verse 27, it said, it, God's word says, So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God created you to be like him in some noble way. Why? Why? For a number of reasons. So you could know him personally. So you could reflect the nature of God to the world. So you could play a role as reflector of the creator onto the world. He wants you to steward that which he has made. But here in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 it says that he predestined us for adoption to himself. Now, there's some key words here. First of all, predestined. Predestined. Before you go and think too much about that word, let's just take it at face value. To be predestined means that he thought of you and thought of your purpose before there was even a you. In fact, before there was time and space and substance, Before there was the very cosmos in which we live, God had you on his mind. Now this is no small thing. And then look at that passage of scripture there, that that phrase too, where he says that he predestined us according to the purpose of his will. Now what does that mean? Fundamentally it means God wanted there to be a you. 
And that's no small thing. You see, you are not, do you hear me? You are not some evolutionary accident. It does not matter how you came into this world. It does not matter the circumstances of your birth. No matter what, God thought of you before there was a you. You are God's idea, not just generally as a member of the human race. You are God's idea specifically. And every cell in your body and every cell that will be in your body is God's idea. You may or may not be living up to God's idea. And that's on you. But you are most assuredly God's idea. Now, this idea that God wanted you even before there was a you is powerful to your sense of being divinely loved and of being a heavenly purposed person with a heavenly purposed life. It was in the early summer of 2006 that at 3.40, I remember this, that 3.40 in the morning, I woke up and could not go back to sleep. Now, something about me is usually when I wake up in the middle of the night, I wake up, and I can roll over, and I can close my eyes, and I go back to sleep. It's usually not a problem. But on this morning, I, I, I woke up at 3.40, and I could not go back to sleep. And I felt this incredible sense of urge to go into my study in my house. So I crossed the hall from our bedroom and went into the study, and uh, I sat in my reading chair in that study, and I just asked the Lord, you know, when you wake up in the middle of the night, can't go to sleep, you sometimes wonder, did, did God get you up for something? Does he want to speak something to your heart? Does he want you to pray about somebody or something? Or, so I said, Lord, what am I here for? And I looked to my right, I looked on the floor next to the reading chair and there was a magazine. I picked up the magazine and I opened it up and it fell open to an article about how a man and his wife had adopted two boys. And instantly I had this powerful impression that I am convinced was from the Lord that I too was to adopt a foreign born son, that I was to become his father, that I was to share Jesus with him and prepare him for his calling. And I wasn't the same after that. I mean, I just knew that I couldn't unthink that thought. And uh, for weeks, I wouldn't tell my wife, because I wasn't real sure how committed I wanted to be to this thing that I was feeling called to. But it wouldn't go away. And then one day, I got kidney stones, and she was sitting next to me in the hospital right before I was going into surgery, and they gave me some of that happy medicine that Sometimes just, I don't know how happy it makes you, but sometimes it makes you a little bit emotional and some of your uh, defenses kind of drop away. And uh, I started to cry and I looked over to her and I said, uh, I got to tell you something before I go into surgery. And she goes, what? And I said, well, I, I feel like we're called to adopt. And she said, well, I've felt that for years, but never told you because I figured you'd shut me down. And she was probably right. We came home after that surgery, and we, I kind of wanted us just to pray about it for a while, just kind of keep it to ourselves, and we were at dinner time, and, and uh, she said in front of the kids, so when are we telling the kids? <laughs> so I was like, ah, oh, shut up. <laughs> it was interesting. I went, well, okay, and we told the kids what we were thinking about, and I said, but we're just praying about it, and, and uh, the kids said, well, we were praying about that yesterday, and we felt called to do that too. And I went, oh my goodness. And so we began our journey. And we began that journey thinking about our son. Even before we had seen him or knew him, even before we had been accepted by the adoption agency as a candidate for adoption, we were thinking about this boy. In fact, at this time, unbeknownst to us, he was not even born. But that didn't matter. We had a thought of him. We had a vision of him. And it drove us to begin the work to adopt, to begin the work to find out who he would be, to get the paperwork ready, to bring, get the money together, 
And often I, I, I tell my son this story. In fact, the, the place where God spoke to my heart for me to adopt is now his bedroom. And so there's been many a times when I've been sitting in bed with him before he goes to bed, and he'd say, tell me the story again. And I'd point to the corner and say, it was right there that God laid on my heart to adopt you. And I didn't even know there was you. You weren't even born yet. And Why do I tell him this? Because I want him to know how wanted he was and is. That he was wanted before he ever was. You see, God thought of you before there was a you. And he wants you to know that your value transcends time and space. His involvement in the world has always been with you in mind. He knew of you and thought of you and thought up you before there was anything. And then when he created everything, he created it with you in mind as a part of it all. So you're important. Your existence is important. Your involvement is important. Your relationship with him is important. You can't get more important than that. Let that sink in. When you're thinking about what you're going to do with your life, consider greatly that it is God who thought of you, who has always had a will for you. I mean, won't you live your life for the one who thought of you before there was a you? Who else could you live for that is more important than that, that loves you more than that, that has regarded you more than that? There's no one, nothing that compares with that kind of regard that God has for you. Now the second thing is this. Your adoption into God's family displays number two on your outline, that God loved you before he adopted you. It was amazing to our family how much we fell in love with our adopted son even before we had been assigned a child. We, we didn't have a picture, we didn't, we didn't know of him, we didn't have a bio, we, we didn't know who we were gonna be assigned, but just the thought of him, we began to fall in love with him. We were applying to an adoption agency, filing stacks of forms is crazy, with the government, and the, the whole time we were falling in love with this little boy, even before we knew who he was or what he looked like. And then one day we get this call to go to the adoption agency, which just happens to be in our neighborhood. And so we, uh, we gather the kids after school, and we get in the car, and we drove over there, we went upstairs to a particular little conference room area, and they, they set a picture before us on the table of a little boy that had been born two weeks prior. And so this would have been the uh, second half of uh, November of 2006. And we looked at this boy, and you know, he's just a baby, a wrinkled face, and all that, and said, do you want him? Without hesitation, we said, yes. And I cannot explain to you how deeply I fell and my wife fell and my other three children fell in love with this little boy and yet we had not yet adopted him. We couldn't even be guaranteed him at that time. And for eight months we would be making preparations to complete the adoption and go and get him from Guatemala. Technically, he was not our son yet. Not legally. But it didn't matter. We were falling in love with him. And you know, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, says, even as he chose us, you studied this last week, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And then look at the next word. In love he predestined us. In love he chose us. In love, before there was even a you, he thought of you and he loved you. Listen, you know, my son Micah is precious and he's special, but that's not why I love him. I didn't fall in love with him because he was cute. I fell in love with him long before I had a picture of him. At first, I didn't even know what he looked like. I fell in love with him because it was in my heart to love him. God loved you even before he adopted you. That is to say, 
if he has adopted you. And if he's yet to adopt you yet because you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior yet, fear not. He's loved you all along. And he loves you now. And he wants you to be adopted and grafted into God's family. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, But as many as received him, received Jesus, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. We become children of God by accepting God's Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay for our sins, rose again to be our Savior. And when we receive him, we receive that salvation and that forgiveness and that grace. And we are brought into the family of God, regenerated, reborn in his family forevermore. The adoption into God's family also displays that God wanted to become a heavenly father for you. God wants that. The Bible says in verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. It's a relationship. Sons and daughters are related to fathers and mothers. And God is saying, I came to be your father. And he did this, the Bible says, according to the purpose of his will. In other words, he wants this role in your life. We see that in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, says that he, he teaches us that we are to pray to the Lord by saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The very will of God is that you would have God as your Father. He wants you to be his family doesn't get more beautiful than that. That's how much God loves you. And he would send his son Jesus. You see, your sin separates you from all of this. But he sent Jesus, the sinless Savior, to die and pay the penalty of your sin so that you wouldn't have to and so that you could be free and so that you could be brought into his family. He wanted to become a heavenly father for you. I know what some of you are thinking. I'm a terrible son. I'm a terrible daughter. God doesn't want to be my father. Well, let me give you a little secret. Um, I, I thought that when we were going to adopt this little Guatemalan boy, I, I, I guess I had this kind of like rose-colored glasses I was looking through to view my life, and I thought, you know, you know I'm doing something really wonderful. I'm adopting so probably this is just going to be a sweet, happy-go-lucky child that is going to just behave most of the time, and it's going to be just like tiptoeing through the tulips. And, you know, it really hasn't been. Not at all. It's been more like tiptoeing through the minefield, like every other child that I have. All right? It's been challenging in every way that it's been challenging with all the other kids that I have brought into the world. But I love my boy, and I'm glad to be his father. And almost every night before he goes to bed, I'll say, I'm so glad to be your father. And he says, I'm glad you're my dad. And you know what? You and I, we disappoint God the Father. But that never means he stops wanting to be our father or loving us or disciplining us, or calling us to live a nobler way. He loves you. He loves you. And he doesn't cast you out. He calls you in. And fourth, God's adoption in, of you into his family displays that God embarks on an all-out pursuit of you. I want you to look at, at Luke chapter 15, this story that we read earlier, where we see a shepherd pursues his lost lamb. And God pursues you. God pursues you. And you might say, well, why? Why does God pursue me? Well, if we haven't already established well enough, let's look at this story for a moment. God pursues you because, A, your soul is of great value to him. Look at verse 4 of chapter 15 verse, uh, of, of the book of Luke. 
What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? It's not good enough for him to have 99 when there were 100 to account for. When you're lost out in sin, he doesn't look and say, well, you know, we had enough people at church today. Looks pretty good. We can do with a few less. It's all right. I got four kids. If I lose one of them, I'm not going to say, oh, my goodness, I lost one. Oh, but that's okay. Acceptable loss. I still got three. And hey, you know, one less mouth to feed. Right? You know, I'm not going to think that way. You're not going to think that way. No, you go to the, to the nth degree to find that one that's lost. And God loves you. All of you matter to God. Everyone outside this building matters to God. It doesn't matter how strung out they are. It doesn't matter what color they are or how much money they make or how society views them. It doesn't matter whether they're your enemy or your friend. God loves them and they matter to him and warrant an all-out search. You see, B, God pursues you because your lostness warrants a great pursuit of him. He says, if he's lost one of them, does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it? God pursues you. My friends, this is really important for us to grasp because we need to understand that God is using us as his people to pursue those who need the Lord. We're the body of Christ And Christ is on a mission to reach people to be brought into the family of God, which means as members of his body, him being the head, we are to participate with Christ in reaching out to others and telling them of the love of God and inviting them into this relationship with Christ that we have discovered. And those people out there warrant an all-out search. Warrant your effort, your time, your talents, your treasure to care for and love and meet needs of and to say, we want to invite you into an experience of the good news of Jesus. It's so important that we grasp this, that we reach out like crazy. And I've already told you a few weeks ago after our Karen church uh, um, our Korean church launched out that we were going to have more room in the building, more room in classrooms, more room for more preschool and children and youth. And it's so important that what we do is we start going, okay, we got space here, facility isn't a problem, so what do we do to reach more people and bring them here to include them in the experience of the gospel that we have? Who is it that lives around us? Who is it that, that is near us? Who is it that uh, is in our family? Who is it that we work with or a client that we serve that we can sense that God is doing something in their life and we want to invite them and bridge, be a bridge for them relationally to the gospel and to an experience of God's people, the church? Let's share our faith with them. Let's lead them to Christ. Let's baptize them, incorporate them into the life of the church. Because God wants us to partner with him in his all-out search for every single lost person who will receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And see, God pursues you because your salvation is worthy of a great celebration with him. Look at verse 5 and 7. The Bible says, And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. You can see the lamb on the shepherd's shoulders and He's bringing that lamb home, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost, just so I tell you. And then Jesus says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. 
The Bible says that heaven rejoices when anyone comes into the family of God. I can remember after we adopted Micah, we did all the paperwork and we went to the U.S. Embassy and we, we got all of that taken care of there in Guatemala and, and then we went out to celebrate. We went to Antigua, drove there and saw the sights and we had a big meal and we celebrated. And then we flew home a couple days later and flew home and some of you were waiting for us at the, uh, at the airport 11 and a half years ago and with signs and gifts and hugs and te- uh, taking pictures. And then we came home and there was a bunch of you coming uh, to our home. And, uh, and then there was a kind of a big party at church. There was a, a, uh, um, you know, a baby shower, I guess is what you call it. And and uh, Micah still has some of the cool stuff that you gave. And, and we just had this celebration, right? We found this child who didn't have a home. He's got a home now. We found this child that was orphaned, didn't have a dad or a mom or siblings. Now he does forever. Years ago, here at this church, we had a, an ex, we would have an experience. Uh, we would baptize people, and then a couple times a year, we'd have what we call a heaven celebration party. And we would have on a Sunday night. We would have uh, a celebration where everybody that had been baptized in X number of months prior, we would kind of feature and celebrate and clap and sing about it and and uh, tell stories and testimonies of, about how these people had come to Christ. And then afterwards, we'd have a have a big old potluck meal or a pizza meal in, in our uh, fellowship area of the church. And we called it Heaven Celebration. And we talk about how heaven's been celebrating ever since those people came into the family. We ought to, we ought to do that again. We ought, to, we ought to revive the Heaven Celebration here at our church. We ought to baptize people and find ways to celebrate in big ways what God is doing. Because my friend, for those of you that have received Christ you got a gotcha day. Like I said, you might not remember what day it is for you. I don't even remember the exact day. I remember it was in April of uh, 1985. I I can remember that. I don't remember the exact day. Might be able to put it back to put it together, but I, I don't remember the exact day, but I remember that it happened. I have a gotcha day. Many of you have a gotcha day, and if so, thank the Lord for that recognize that you have been wanted and loved in this way and allow that to drive every decision you make in your life. But if you're somebody today that you go, you know, I don't have a gotcha day. But when you talk about a gotcha day, my heart's pounding fast. My faith in Jesus is starting to rise within me. Well, then you know what, my friend? Today is supposed to be your gotcha day. And you could receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior right now. You could come into his life as he comes into your life. And this could be your first day of saving grace. I'd like everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes for a moment. And I want to specifically speak to the person right now that just might be feeling a sense that Now's the time to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to turn from your sin and to turn to Christ and to receive Him and determine to live your life for Him and with Him. To receive His forgiveness and His grace and a relationship with Him that lasts forever. If I'm speaking to you right now, then in the quietness of where you are, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer after me, to repeat it after me and say it to the Lord. Just speak softly to God. He'll hear you. And say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know I've been a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I accept Christ as my Savior and Lord. And I receive your forgiveness over my soul. I give you my life for you to be my Lord, my leader. And I enter into your family through the adoption of Christ. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for coming into my life. 
I will follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now look